thank you very much uh, for the warm introduction. Um, and I'm also thankful to you uh, for inviting me uh, for this webinar to speak on this topic of the contemporary cyber crimes uh, and the preventions. Possibly uh, some part of the investigations also I'll try to cover if time permits me to do it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all the participants at their respective homes and their respective places are hearty and healthy. Please keep doing so. Uh, don't go out. And uh, I'm sure that in a few days from now, we'll be able to over this pandemic. And once again, uh, we'll be same as what we were there a couple of months before. And uh, that may not be far away from now. So uh, my presentation that is on the contemporary cybercrime, I'll try to focus mostly on the uh, real life case studies and also talk to you uh, in terms of the uh, investigation, the law related to it. Uh, in fact, uh, at all given time, uh, we talk about uh, cyber security, cyber security, but then uh, very rarely we do talk that if security is breached, then what postmortem happens? I think that also is equally important for us to know at this present moment. Before I do start the uh, do start my presentations, I hope my presentation is there. Hello, it's coming. It's coming. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. Before I do start my uh, presentation and showing you some few slides, I just wanted to share with you that. Uh, I got some uh, a WhatsApp message, probably from one of the participants who has sent this WhatsApp message to me. And uh, his name is uh, Professor Anand Prakash Dubey. I don't know whether he is there at this moment with us. And um, he just sent, uh, he just pinged me up at around at 11.59. Uh, you know, he just pinged me up saying that Ke, I am in problem. So. I said, what happened? And this is a, a WhatsApp chat, which has come from his number. And uh, he says that yeah, I'm stuck up in Allahabad. So I just chatted and said, in what way I can help you? So he pinged me back and said that, okay, uh, please transfer 20,000 in my account urgently as I'm stuck up over here. I think uh, uh, this is something, a WhatsApp message. Anand, are you here? You must listen. I, 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 I am listening. I am listening, Abhishek. Yes. But oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how, you, how you know, Doctor Dikosha, sir, and how you have messaged him for? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked, Abhishek. <laughs> <laughs> What's the number? Uh, the number to... is seven three seven six double five two zero four five. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't believe. Okay. There is some problem. I think security issue. <laughs> and I'm in. I'm not in Allahabad, sir. I'm in Varanasi now. But uh, but you just uh, WhatsApp me. You ping me up. You're stuck up some in Allahabad. Uh, no, sir. It's not true. I'm in Varanasi. <laughs> Anand Dubey ji, uh, it is a part of the training program which you are attending. <laughs> okay, okay. I am. I know that. I know that. <laughs> yeah. I I, I yeah. Um, I think uh, you know this is something. The, uh, this is the real life, real life case studies. And uh, uh, since I handle the real life cases, and uh, I see such type of the spoofed messages which are presented sometimes in the court or are presented to the law enforcement agency, and uh, there are a lot of issues which take place up as how to believe that uh, this chat, this piece of a chat, is a genuine is full, is fake, so on and so forth. It's not only this. In fact, uh, I've got a SMS from uh, a number 8056136114. At about 12.08, I just got a SMS from this number as hello. And uh, I believe that uh, this also is a faculty somewhere from Christ College, if I'm not mistaken. I just verified it later on, and I said, Ki, is it a uh, number is genuine? This number is genuine, 
I just come from this SMS has come to me from this number. Very shocking. And uh, I'm sure that the participant over here will say that I have never sent to you. But then here is the digital evidence with me, which says that this message has come to me at 1208 from this number to me. So these are actually the cyber crimes. And uh, I also got an email from Professor Saurav. And uh, I'll come to that a little later. And uh, he also has sent an uh, email to me regarding some college admissions, you know, in his college. And uh, I will come to that email sometime from now. But what I mean to say is that at this moment, I'm not seeing you all face to face. What I've got is just your numbers. And you have sent a WhatsApp to me. You have sent an SMS to me. You have sent an email to me. And uh, if I'm unaware that this is not sent by you, I believe that I will conclude that it is sent by you itself. And I think under these circumstances, the objective of this session would be that these cyber crimes, what happened in the real life cases or the real life scenarios, how it could be prevented, protected, that's one side of the story. I'm sure that the morning couple of sessions you might have gone in terms of uh, understanding more from the security aspect. But I believe that uh, using the digital space, I think we should have little uh, a mind that is the investigative mind also as how we can detect it. And prevention is very important. And of course, if tomorrow this matter takes up the legal ladder, then how this piece of evidence would be presented and how the matter could reach to a logical conclusion. So all the all the participants, uh, you know, the messages or the WhatsApp or the email, what has come to me, I thank them very much. I'm sure that they only have sent to me. The burden of proof is on them to say that they have not sent it. But during the course of this session, I will tell you, I will conclude you that uh, what is this particular space? How dangerous is this space? And how come we can make it more secure and safe? Some few questions I have got before I start my the second part of the session. And that is the, the internet. So when you talk about the internet, as of now, there is no owner of internet. In fact, when you talk about the internet, uh, internet came in our country about 26 years before, precisely in 1994. And in the last 26 years, we have almost got close to 68 to 69 crore Indians who are using internet today. In fact, the big problem which of the internet what we have today is that we have an issue of the jurisdiction, which means that if you are sending a mail to me from your Gmail account, the mail first gets into a server in US. From there, it is routed to me. God forbid tomorrow, if the email what I receive is something which is unlawful, then how do I trace this? How do I track it? Is something a question which we'll try to deal with. But internet, as of now, doesn't have any owner. It's a consortium of group of people or a group of association who have come together to form this body. And we have one agency, and that agency called as ICANN, which up till September 2016 was completely under the US government. But then September 21st, 2016 onwards, ICANN has become more or less as an independent body. Most of the countries are members of this body. But then we are also, we Indians are also a member of this body. But then uh, most of these rules, regulations, which have been set on the internet is actually governed by an organization, which is ICANN. On a piece of paper, ICANN is an independent body, but it is placed in United States of America. ICANN is, a, ICANN is an agency which keeps a track of all the so-called, you know, uh, the domains what we register is stored in the register of ICANN, which is a custodian of all the domains at their end. And as on now itself, as on now also, it is a premier organization which, uh, which is overrules the policies, guidelines of the internet. In fact, uh, I'm, uh, I think I'm just waiting for the presentation. So if it's coming, then I believe I can just show you some slides and I can go ahead also. 
Sir, presentation. Sir, presentation is already on there. Is there? Yes, yes. Oh, I cannot see it. Huh? Mm. Okay. Okay. Fine, fine. In fact, um, I have another laptop, so I'll just uh, see that part. Okay. Uh, I, I want to show you some statistics, uh, the cybersecurity incidents, and we have got CERTIN. The CERTIN is a nodal agency of the government of India, which comes under the Ministry of uh, Information Technology, New Delhi. And uh, I've got some certain statistics to tell you that between 2015 to 2019, there is almost six times more cybersecurity breaches which has taken place. Uh, in the year 2015, we had close to about 50,000 cybersecurity breaches and uh, 2019 till October. So I have the figures till October 2019. We almost have about 313,000 cybersecurity breaches. Now, these cybersecurity breaches, they are being put in front of CERT. CERT goes through it and then they try to block these threats or they try to block these websites which promotes some unlawful activities, so on and so forth. Well, the cybercrime cases over a decade in India, in fact, between 2007 to 2017, there is a huge rise of cybercrimes in our country. In 2007, we had about 480 odd cybercrimes registered. And in 2017, it's climbed up almost to 21,800 cybercrimes that have been officially registered which means the cyber crimes have grown leaps and bounds. The registration also has grown leaps and bounds. But what picture I'm just showing to you is about 20, 21,800, the cyber crime, uh, the registration of cyber crime, which has taken place. This is just a tip of an iceberg, it's just a tip of an iceberg. The actual figure could be at least 10 to 15 times more as to the real cases, which is happening in our country. Well, the reasons are plenty. I travel all over India. And when I travel all over India, I talk to various uh, state police. I have, uh, I have a privilege since I train the judicial officers of the country. So most of the judges to whom I talk during the training program, they say that okay, we just get some part of the matters in our court. But then the real scenario is very, very high. A lot of cyber crimes do take place. And that's the the figure also which you have in front of you. The increased use of internet. Well, while the increased uh, mobile and inter uh, internet penetration in the country has increased, so far as the cyber crimes also have increased. Few statistics in front of you. We have almost about 68 to 69 crore Indians today using internet. We almost have about uh, 44 crore Indians today using WhatsApp. We almost have about 28 to 30 crore Indians using the, our Facebook. We have almost have, have about 31 to 32 crore Indians today using emails. In, in fact, in all of these statistics, what I just mentioned to you, either we are number one or we are number two. Least to say, we almost have close to 1 billion Indians who are using mobile phone. And uh, most of the mobile phones are active. All said and done. We have almost about 48% of the mobiles, which are the smartphones, vis-a-vis -vis the 52% which are the 2G or they are the feature phone where internet uh, till today is a uh, luxury on these devices. Well, uh, the last year's statistics, well, more than 24,000 of the cases have been registered under the IT Act under the different uh, provisions of the Information Technology Act 2000. IPC, the Indian Penal Code, and the other state legislations. The next slide that shows you something about the digital around the world in 2018. In fact, uh, these are some of the figures. The world's population then was almost about 7.6 billion, out of which uh, in 2018, in the early part of 2018, we almost had about 400 crore Indians, uh, 400 crores uh, all over the globe, not Indians, uh, using the internet. We have we had almost about 319 crores active social media users, the unique mobile users for 513 crores then and the active mobile social users now are almost then is almost about 295 crores to all of this. You can add 
except the population to all the other figures you can add 20% more to give you the realistic figure as as to now what could be the penetration as far as the internet the mobile the social media apps usage is concerned but the next slide is very interesting to the part that these are the 10 different types of cyber crime what i have specified to you is my actual live practice and uh, whatever uh, case studies i am going to discuss with you they are not there from any book they are the actual case studies which i had assisted solved at the ground level with the law enforcement agencies of course providing the evidence in the court as an expert so on and so forth the first of the the cyber crime i'll just like to add about two to three lines into this and some cases i would like to give you some real life examples also so you appreciate the subject and understand that it it can happen to us and if it can happen to us if it can happen to me it can happen to you that means it can happen to everybody in this world the first one is cyber stalking well it's a harassment you know harassing a person over the internet this is one of the crime which has been growing exponentially mostly women are been targeted as far as the stalking crimes are concerned and to some extent even the children's they are been stalked harassed over the internet the next one is cyber contraband well buying and selling of illegal items over the internet well there are some certain pseudo names and on these pseudo names the illegal items they have been sold they have been bought on the internet and many of the times these particular items which are sold on the internet which are illegal or unlawful in nature are sold on the dark web deep web so on and so forth the next one is cyber trespassing and when you talk about cyber trespassing it means sitting far away you can access somebody's mobile and access somebody's digital device can access somebody's mobile and under these circumstances many a times the victim is unaware that his or her mobile is been trespassed I'd like to share with you an example which happened uh, uh, with me i was uh, one of the person it did not happen to me it's not i was not a victim but it happened with one of a very very senior person uh, i was in goa i had gone for a conference and it was a three days conference where we had the law enforcement and the judicial officers of the country meeting in goa for a three day conference i had a session to talk about the cyber crime and giving a picture as how this cyber crimes could be uh, minimized so on and so forth and so under these circumstances uh, it so happened that uh, i had a, a one more senior resource just after me who had who, were, who was uh, talking about a topic in terms of the media trial who he was at the topic and of course he was from the media fraternity itself so my session got over his session got over the first day itself when the session got over we were uh, we became quite good friends and then in the later part of the evening at about 5:30 5:45 we were strolling on the side of a beach goa is full of beaches to that fact and as we were strolling on the side of the beach his phone started suddenly to buzz and as phone started to buzz he almost ran for about 400 to 500 meters and after running that much distance he took his mobile phone he spoke after about 5 to 7 minutes he came to the place where i was strolling and he only said he sorry i had a call i said no problem he said no no you may be thinking that ki why i was running when i received the call well in my mind i was thinking but then of course it was not my any of my matter to ask him about it he said look i ran when the call came because it was my wife who called me up now that was something little very surprising to me so i just okay i said he only said i ran because i told my wife that before coming to the conference that the conference is in amdavad and i came over here to goa for the conference so i just asked ki how will your wife know that you have come to goa for the conference he said look when we were strolling on the side of the beach a slight sound of the wave of the sea will trigger my wife's brain 500 kilometers away and she will come to know that i am somewhere near the seashore 
And once going home, then she will ask me 101 questions for which I may not have any reply. So that's why I ran almost about 400 to 500 meters before just taking up the call. What I mean to say is that these incidents, what we see on the internet, we see, we feel that we are very much secured. We are very much protected. But I think through this example, you would realize that we are not that secured, not that particular uh, complete, we're not safe so far as that we don't have the actual security practices in place to put about it. Well, I had a little hearty laugh and he also just uh, in a hearty way, he said that, look, my wife is Sherlock Holmes version 6.0 and each and everything she will know about my particular conference. So I've just come up over here without telling her so on and so forth. Three days, the conference got over. He went back to Mumbai. I came to Pune. And the very next day, early morning, he called me up and he said, breaking news. I said, what happened? He said, my wife came to know that I was in Goa. I said, probably she will know because you are a big personality. Somebody might have, you know, might have seen you, might have taken your photograph and then your photo might have become viral, which might have reached your wife's mobile. And then she would have come to know, OK, you are in Goa. He said, no. I said, the another thing which comes to my mind is that you got done from your airport. You had your boarding pass. Maybe she got got hold of your boarding pass from there. She came to know that you flew now from Goa to Mumbai. He said, no. He said, I've got a principle. And the principle is that the moment I board my flight, or the moment I, sorry, I come out of the flight, I tear my boarding pass at least in four or five pieces, throw in the dustbin inside the airport, and then I come out. Then I also realized, oh, his wife is maybe really Sherlock Holmes. And then he said to me, look, after 18 years of the marriage, my wife gifted me a mobile phone. And when she gifted me a mobile phone, she said, if you love me, you will only use this mobile phone from now. And I started using that mobile phone, not knowing that that mobile phone had an app installed, which was trespassing me and telling each and every particular statistics about me where I am, which location I am, with whom I'm talking, with whom I'm chatting, what message I'm receiving, what message I'm sending, what are my surfing habits, so on and so forth. Cyber trespassing is today one of the most, most south of crime, which is taking place in this digital world. I'm sure some of the participants may be thinking, what is this tool about? And where do you get this tool? Well, I would say that the internet is full of such type of things. But let me also tell you that using such type of a tool to trespass is an offense. It's a part of hacking where we have got a provision in Information Technology Act. We have got Section 43 and the Section 66 of the Information Technology Act, which talks about the hacking. It's a cognizable offense. So never we should breach this type of a security by putting an app in somebody's mobile and trying to figure out his or her location and whereabouts. In this case, his wife told each and everything for the last three months. In fact, for the last three and a half months, she had installed this app. And this gentleman never knew. I asked him that in the last three and a half months, did you not, did you do not go to a place where you have not told your wife? He said, on two, three occasions, I did go. I said, Ki, why she did not tell you at that time? He said, probably that three, three and a half months was my probation period. And in my probation period, I was found to be OK. But after the probation period of mine, still, I was not improving. I think that's the point. She caught me up and she said, in the last three, three and a half months, each and everything about my whereabouts, she spoke. I was just listening. And she was just saying. What I mean to say is that, when you have your mobile phone, most of the time we install apps. We don't read the terms and conditions. We don't read the privacy policy. We just install the app for the sake of installing it without knowing that some of these apps may work like a spy, may steal our information and give to third party without our knowledge. And we would be dealing up into some problems. So beware of this. And as I go ahead, at the later part of my part in terms of prevention, I will also tell you that how you could be secured from such type of a breaches, how you will not give your own personal confidential data, sensitive data from your mobile 
to a third party who is not authorized to look into, who is not authorized to see what you are doing it. The next one is cyber laundering. Well, money laundering. A lot of cases of money laundering have taken place. In fact, Bitcoin is one of those currency, a virtual currency, which is used for money laundering. And uh, recently, Bitcoin once again has become a legal tender. For a couple of years, Bitcoin was banned. Well, we were not able to do any type of our transactions, either buying or selling. But now Bitcoin, once again, has happened a legal tender. But then what I mean to say is that many of these shady things, shady financial transactions today also are taking place through this Bitcoin. Money laundering activities are being done with this mode. The next one is cyber vandalism. I am sure that most of you over here are coming from an academic background. And I'm sure that you might have heard your students saying that I want to become an ethical hacker. I think this term have to be changed. It has to be re-coordinated with some other term. I've seen many students doing this ethical hacking program, but some of them get into some wrong hands. And under these circumstances, these cyber vandalism, when you talk about it means hacking into a network, hacking into an unauthorized machine without proper permission and committing an offense. So under these circumstances, it's very important that what is that ethical hacking, what it teaches us. I have yet to see any ethical hacking program in my 14 years in this field, whether there is any part of a legal side also thought to the students. In fact, the cases what I have handled I have seen youngsters becoming victims. And when you question them, intervene them, how did you come to know about this? They say that we came to know because we did some ethical hacking course, not aware that hacking into a network without a permission, without a written permission for that matter, is a cognizable and a non bailable offense. Section 43 and Section 66 of the Information Technology Act 2000 talks about this part of the hacking. The next, that is cyber deformation. Well, technology is now being misused by a large, large fraternity of people. In fact, WhatsApp University, to me, is a fake university. 80 to 85 percent of the messages which are coming on WhatsApp is doesn't have any origin. In the last, uh, you know, 45, 46 days of this global pandemic of this coronavirus, I had almost about 86 cases coming to me. And one of the case, which just happened to come to me about four to five days before, a senior professor, a lady senior professor from one of the largest state academy in Maharashtra. At about 8.30 in the evening, she sent a message to me. She sent an image to me saying that those people who are using webinar, it is an offense as declared by the government of India. And that particular image, what she has sent to me, was posted on a canvas of Aztak channel. It showed that this was a breaking news on Aztak. And the message was there that using webinar is an offense under Section 498 of Indian Penal Code, an offense shall be registered. And just next to that particular display was the photograph of our prime minister. Now, this was sent to me. I looked at it and then I forensically examined it, which, of course, I come from this field of forensic. So it did not take much time. In next 10 minutes, I was ready with my answer saying that this was fake. It was nicely crafted image, which was pasted on the canvas of an Aajtak picture, just to show that this message has been broadcasted on Aajtak channel. What I mean to say is WhatsApp, a fake university, a lot of particular messages are being generated through this media. And therefore, we should be very cautious that whatever we are floating through this fake university, it has to be properly verified, checked. Otherwise, it may happen that we could be liable for spreading up rumors through this social media, through this WhatsApp, 
through this chat, so on and so forth. Another interesting thing which came to me during this time is a liquor shop owner. He called me up and he said that my liquor shop photo has been taken and it's put on Facebook and a XYZ number is displayed on my liquor shop's image that those who want liquor can contact on this number. His friend told him that, what are you doing? Don't you know that selling of liquor is banned? It's an offense. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I am only sitting at home waiting when this lockdown will get over. He said, that's whenever it will get over, it will get over. But what you are doing is wrong at this moment. He said, what? He said that you are selling liquor and you have you are advertising on the social media, on the Facebook. And so he shared that image to this guy, to his friend. He called me up and he said that there is a misuse of my photograph of my shop on which a number has been displayed, which is belonging to some XYZ person could be, but not belonging to for sure. And through this way, it has been said that liquor is sold by him, by his agency, and the liquor will be sold. It will come online to the respective houses, whoever has asked for. So we called that particular number and we called on that number. It belonged to some person, XYZ, from one of the state of our country. And then he said that, he, yes, I can provide this liquor, pay this, this money onto an Paytm account. And the moment you pay that money, in the next four to five hours, the liquor shall be dispatched at your place. What I mean to say is that he, today, the images which are being uploaded on the internet are misused to a large extent. My suggestion, especially to women, is that whenever you are uploading your information, you can upload your information, but don't upload your photographs. Don't upload any images because mis images may be misused in the longer run of this. 72% of the victims are women as compared to 22% who are men. What I mean to say in this case study, when finally, when finally we were able to track that person out, and then when the person was caught, he said that, look, I'm a migrant. I want to go back to my place. I don't have money. I don't have money to buy food. And so he thought about this idea. What I mean to say is that such type of crimes have now been increased. The hospitals are the most targeted in US. Most of the hospitals are now targeted in the name of COVID-19. I had also a case coming from a doctor to me. He said that he, I am an advisor to various pharmaceutical companies in the country. And I give them advice on COVID-19. And so his advice were through emails. And three, four days, everything was OK. Till one fine day, there was an email which went from his email ID to this multinational pharmaceutical company in our country, which was never sent by him. And when this pharmaceutical company got in touch with him and said, this advice, what you have given to us is completely baseless. He said, which advice? He said, you have advised us on your email. He said, no, I've never sent it. He thought that his email account was hacked, but actually his email account was not hacked. His email ID was spoofed. And that's what I believe that Professor Saurabh, you know, he also has sent an email to me. And in the later part of the session, I will just dwell upon it and tell you that by just knowing an email ID without knowing the password, an email can be sent from one person to another person in this universe. Today, it is more important to identify that the email which has been received is a genuine one or a spoofed one. When he called me, I just went on. I just verified that email. I did a forensic check and found that this email was originated from Nigeria. And the spam score of this email was more than 100. In order to ensure that any email which is authentic in nature, the spam score should always be less than 5. Any score greater than 5 of an email, you can consider it that it is a spoofed one. It's not a genuine one. The email ID is of the genuine person, but it is not being broadcasted from that particular person, from his particular genuine mail server. Well, I have a question. Of course, this is in a asynchronous mode. I'm sure that most of you, most of you 
have an email account registered in Gmail. But I'm sure that most of us have never read the privacy policy or the terms and conditions of Gmail. And if you have not read it, I think we are at a big loss. Three things to be checked whenever you register yourself now on an email server. The first thing to check where the mail server is registered and where the server is located. Well, all of these mail servers, in fact, 95 to 96% of us, we Indians, we have a personal email ID either registered on Gmail, Yahoo, or Hotmail, or any foreign based servers. Number two, where is the jurisdiction? In fact, all these mail servers, what I said to you, the jurisdiction happens to be out of India. And number three, and the most important thing, and that is how far are these mail servers secured? In the last session, for something about half an hour, I was there. And uh, I heard the speaker talking about Aragya Setu. I will also dwell upon it a little, probably from a techno legal perspective, in making the other side of the story also realize that why people today feel that whether this app is good or bad, from a liberal point of view, at the end of the day, the app is used for a good purpose that is said without any particular doubt. But what I mean to say, coming back to my topic, that is cyber defamation, WhatsApp, a fake university. In fact, when you talk about a WhatsApp in real time investigation, we have a tough time because the server of WhatsApp is outside India. It's in US, but WhatsApp by its inherent nature is a virtual server. And being a virtual server, it acts like a post office. When it acts like a post office, it means that WhatsApp will get the message on its server and it will transmit to the recipient. It will never store the message in its server. And therefore, tomorrow, if you want to find the origin of a WhatsApp message from where it has come, who has sent, it becomes a big Herculean task. Even the law enforcement agency, when they get in touch with WhatsApp, WhatsApp doesn't reply to them. The simple reason is that they say that we are a virtual server and we don't store any message at our end. This is one of those particular disadvantages of WhatsApp, which is used as an advantage by the cyber criminals. But let me tell you, we are also equally intelligent when we do the investigations. We also have some digital footprints technique by which we reach to that particular criminal, maybe a little late, but we reach that particular criminal who has floated any type of a fake, fictitious message using the WhatsApp server. Point number two, in the defamation point of view itself. In fact, uh, most of us, in fact, all of us consider that WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. Well, I don't have a debate on that. To technical perspective, I do go that WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. But from a legal perspective, this encryption can be challenged in the court. Once again, would like to share with you one of the case studies, or one of the real life case studies, when I was conducting a program for the senior CBI officials. And while I was conducting a session, the debate came across that WhatsApp is end to end encrypted. All the investigating agency of CBI said that today, the evidence which we get from a WhatsApp is a primary in nature. And therefore, we don't require any ocular witnesses. We don't require any witnesses to be examined because whatever the evidence you have on a WhatsApp, a printout being deposed in front of the court, along with some certain certificate, it's considered to be a primary evidence in nature. And then I come from a techno legal background. And therefore, under these circumstances, I said that, okay, look, technically, you may be right, but legally, you are not right. He said, how it is so? So I just asked one of the senior officers, I said, can you just ping me and send a message to me? I want to meet you. And so immediately he just pinged from his WhatsApp number to me. I want to meet you. But believe me, when it came to my mobile, it never came. I want to meet you. It came. I want to kill you. And when this message came, the joint director also was there. I went to him and he said, look, sir, your assistant is threatening me. He said, what are you talking about? I showed him the message. He said, what are you talking about? He sent to you, I want to meet you. How with that it came as I want to kill you on your device? 
what i mean to say is that from a legal perspective whatsapp messages are debatable well no more you can consider it as a primary evidence till a thorough investigation is being done to find out the authenticity of that particular message which has come from x number to y number in fact as i just mentioned to you sometime before whatsapp being a fake university why only i should talk about whatsapp there are many other social networking sites which are equally vulnerable and not taking proper care privacy is a big concern and therefore lot of particular defamatory contents are been broadcasted through this server making the people go in the wrong direction making the people believe that this is authentic but it is not so and in this last 45 46 days of lockdown of this lockdown tons of whatsapp messages been percolated onto the whatsapp mode many of them were found to be fake in fact there has to be an agency which has to be formed now by the government of india to verify these messages which have been percolated before it reaches into a common person's account or a common person's mobile phone that he or she should not be misguided with these messages the next one is cyber theft information theft data theft today we talk about intellectual property rights well there are issues which are going in the industry now where data has been stolen and we have the issues of the patent the copyright the plagiarism so on and so forth the next one is cyber terrorism well technology misused to commit some terrorist activities and it has been happening so in fact a uh, few months before it was said that if there is any war it's going to be a cyber war i think some of the pundits might have become wrong in this i think in today's part it's not a cyber war we don't know what is the existence of this corona virus from where it has come all we are reading in the media but till today nobody is convinced so whether it's a biological warfare it's no more a cyber warfare for sure but then many of them believed that if the next world war would take place it will be a cyber warfare but then terrorist are misusing this technology to a larger extent but the same technology which is misused by them the same technology is also used to catch them book them and put them into the place into the jail where they are supposed to be there the next one is cyber pornography when almost about two third of the cyber crimes which takes place in our country are related to pornography we have some certain provisions in the information technology act section 67 section 67a section 67b and section 66e of the information technology act which throws light on pornography when i talk about pornography it's a cognizable and a non available offense well section 67a is an adult pornography so far as that there is nothing which has been transferred or transmitted it amount doesn't amount to be a pornography because watching pro- pornography in your private place is not an offense but if you transmit it it happens to be an offense point number 2 section 67b talks about child pornography a possession of any type of a content which is pornographic in nature in any of the laptop digital device or a mobile phone just a mere possession even though not getting to be transmitted is considered to be an offense well in both of the section 67a and section 67b of the information technology act it's a cognizable and a non available offense to take about it we also got section 66e of the information technology act which talks about violation of privacy and most of it it talks about voyeurism i remember about an incident happening in the state of maharashtra where one of the outlets of mcdonalds had a mobile phone with a camera put across into the change room when the women went to the change room she noticed that camera on that mobile phone she told her husband and when she told her husband the mobile phone was verified it was checked the camera was on the investigation revealed that one of the inmate who was working in mcdonald he had hidden that camera inside that particular change room today there are techniques there are technologies which are available which can help you out in finding it out whether this place is wired whether this place there are some hidden cameras installed so on and so forth what i mean to say is that 
today technology is used for a good purpose but a larger share of it also is once again used for a bad purpose also so that's the pornography point of view the next one is cyber fraud and when you talk about the cyber fraud it also means frauds which are taking place on the digital media on the digital mode more or less related to the financial frauds i am sure all of you all of you are been all of them are using debit cards you are using now contactless cards you are using internet banking you are using mobile banking but all of these are used for a good cause but you have to be little cautious when you use these particular technology when you use this particular apps i'm not saying that they are not secured but the usage of this in a secured way has to be more and more practiced many intelligent well qualified people also have become victims of financial frauds when i talk about the financial frauds there is an exclusive topic what i want to talk to you in some time from now because that's most interesting and since i teach rbi so it becomes more interesting for me to tell from the real perspective that how cyber crimes can take place through your e wallet how cyber crimes can take place through the digital mode of transfer and how you could be prevented and protected so these are the 10 different types of cyber crime i tried to cover as much all as possible in this particular 10 different types of cyber crime beautifully Next, covered the country is having the worst and the best cyber security practices well the highest scoring countries per category the highest percentage of mobile malware infections is bangladesh in fact almost 36% of the bangladeshi users mobile phones are infected with a malware and i uh, in my professional part i train the judges from bangladesh from the supreme court from the high court and from the district court also i uh, i trained almost about 80 to 90 judges from uh, bangladesh and when i was training them so they also mentioned that the mobile secrecy is something which is not very accurate in their countries very fragile the next highest number of financial malware attacks is germany so almost 3% of the users who are using internet in germany they are becoming the target of the financial malware attacks the highest percent of computer malware infections is algeria well almost about 32.4% you know the malware the malware infections is almost 32% which means that algeria is one of those countries where cyber security practices are least followed and in the coming slide you'll have one more time the name of algeria coming once again on the wrong side of the story as far as the security practices are not up to the standard highest percentage of telnet attacks is from china remote access is almost what 21.15% highest percent of percentage of attacks by crypto miners is uzbekistan where almost what 14.3% of the users they have been somewhere uh, fiddled riddled by getting into this concept of this cryptocurrency and then losing their hard earned money least prepared was for cyber attacks well it is vietnam and um, if you if you are going through in the present scenario which you read in the internet in the media vietnam is one of those country which is happening to be one of the industrial power house in the days to come but then hold on as far as the least prepared for cyber attacks that is the vietnam it has got a score of 0.245 worst up to date legislation for cyber security is algeria that means the law over here is not up to the mark which means very clear that most of the cases may lead into an acquittal even though they had to be convicted when the country is having worst and best cyber security practices continued forward the lowest percentage of mobile malware infection happens to be japan 1.34% of the users only have been infected through the mobile malware infections lowest lowest number of financial malware attacks ukraine 0.3% only uses as visa vis germany which is almost about 3% of the users lowest percent of computer malware infections well denmark as 5.9% lowest percent percentage of telnet attacks by originating country 
Algeria, Uzbekistan, and Sri Lanka, that is 0.01%. Lowest percentage of attacks by crypto miners, well, Denmark, only 0.61% of the users get affected through this crypto miners through Bitcoin or other source of virtual currency. Best prepared for cyber attacks is Singapore. Well, that's the best prepared country as far as the cyber attacks is concerned, has a score of 0.925. And most to update legislation for cybersecurity, where the laws are stringent, where convictions are more, is France, China, Russia, Germany, and other all the other seven categories. That means there were seven categories on which these particular statistics were being laid upon. Now let me come across to you on this coronavirus era. This is one of those crimes increased, and that is the business email compromise. Well, um, I had uh, one case come to me, I think on 27th or 28th of March, just two or three days, just post the lockdown. Uh, a prominent uh, businessman called me up and he said that he has lost about 65 lakh rupees. I said, what happened? He said, look, I deal with some steel. My company deals with steel. And I have my vendors all across the globe. One of my vendors in Singapore who sells or who dispatches this material to me for the last three, or three to four years is dispatching it. And all the payments are been made to him online. And it's been going well for the last three to four years. So once the once the material is dispatched, when the payment part comes, so the invoice is sent. Based on that invoice, the account number is there where the money has to be transferred. And all was going on well online for the last three to four years. Till March 27, 2020, he received an email from his, from his vendor from Singapore. And this email came from that same identical email ID, which he used to get before for the payment purpose. And this email said to him that this time, the material what I have dispatched to you, you please make the payment of this money, not on that old account, but on this new account. Because due to this coronavirus and all, we have stopped that particular account. There is some audit which is going on. And therefore, this time, you transfer the money in this account. Now, this chief executive officer never understood that this is a spoofed mail. And so under these circumstances, immediately he told his accountant, please transfer the money into the so-and-so vendor's account. And so the money was transferred. Same evening, he got a call from his vendor stating that, I have yet to receive the payment from you. He said, what are you talking? I've already made the payment to you in the morning today. And here is the transaction slip. Now, this vendor was completely nonplussed. He said, no. I have not received it. He said, no, I got a mail from you. And that particular mail, you have said that he, you have given me a new account number. I've transferred the money in that new account. He was saying, but the vendor was reluctant to listen till finally he said, look, you made the payment in some wrong account. The email was not sent by me. And so that matter was referred to me. It went up to the police station and FIR was registered. But then to tell you something, we were able to recover all the 65 lakh rupees. It's very seldomly, let me be very honest to you. How we recovered is not a very big rocket science. We are yet to catch that person who sent this spoofed email. But how we recovered, it was the brilliance of this entrepreneur that the moment he noticed that he has been a victim of cybercrime losing 65 lakh rupees, he immediately went to the police station, immediately got in touch. And during that time, we got in touch with the bank from where the money was transferred into the vendor's account. We requested the bank to freeze the account and not to get this transfer done. Luckily, the money did not get to be transferred. Luckily, I would say very extremely lucky this gentleman was. And then we were able to get this money credited back into the account and his money was safe. What I mean to say in normal circumstances, it would have been an extremely herculean task. The biggest and the most important thing, what this entrepreneur did was that the moment he noticed that he has been victimized, he was quick enough. He responded fast and that saved him by his money not going into 
somebody's account his hard earned money was recovered back and he got it back but these are the things which are now going on to a larger spree in fact a um, lot of spoofed mails are going today also and therefore we have to be extremely cautious that even though you have got uh, your email id you got your email id registered on the most 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 secured server you keep your passwords changing of your email id probably every alternate day you have your passwords as a combination of characters numbers special characters special codes whatsoever having a length of your password may be around 50 but here what i am saying to you is that you don't require the password of an any email id for a email to be sent from a xyz person's email id to a yzx person outside the country or within the country what is today required is the tenacity to identify that the email which has been received is genuine or spoofed and i can assure you and tell you that most of us are not aware how to identify between a genuine mail and a spoofed mail i'll come back to that in some time from now but i wanted to tell you that in today's scenario the business email compromise is something which is on the highest highest plateau and therefore identifying the email whether it is genuine or spoofed is very important and very critical the data of number of cases affected by the business email compromise in india that's the statistics i have got the authentic statistics so that's why i've just put up the only the authentic information 2017 over 180 indian companies were affected with the business email compromise and globally the business email compromise scams targeted over 400 businesses per day in 2017 draining almost 3 million dollars over the last 3 years and in today's scenario the most and the biggest challenge today with all most of the transactions today are going digital email is a why media which is now being used to communicate it becomes that much important for us that whenever we receive any instructions either through a chat or either through an email it's very important to identify the source and more than that it's very important to identify that it is sent by an authentic person before the transaction has been committed i don't have any hesitation in saying that in the days to come if you are not able to identify this a karodpati can become roadpati and a road, road and a roadpati may become karodpati in the days to come well the unsolicited commercial emails in the quarter 2 of 2018 luckily as we indians we are not a part of it the largest number of spam mails are originated from china almost about 14.3% and going above the ladder it's about united nations which is 2.43% so china is one of those countries where the largest number of the spam mails are been coming up and they are been percolated globally worldwide the number of new malware specimen well in uh, point uh, in 2000 uh, 2007 there were about 0.13 million of the malwares well when we talk about the malwares it's very simple malwares happens to be the combination of the the threats which are taken place through virus so worms trojan horse adware spyware so on and so forth all of these particular five different threats they when they combine together they will give you more than 1 million threats which are now available on the internet in fact there was a big big debate of the zoom the zoom app was considered by many as a faulty app unsecured app and people have to be extremely cautious using this app what we see in the media is not a gospel truth so don't believe anything which comes into a media unless and until you start working on to it or you start talking to the people who are there in this domain it may be an adversary just to have that particular company felt lurched out but of course in this case our government took the cognizance of it and issued some guidelines that how the zoom app could be made a secure video conferencing tool most of these so called security breaches were in terms of its usage in fact when you have got people who have been hooked across onto the zoom app it's the administrator who should have the complete control and in the initial days of a lockdown the administrator rights of the zoom app was there with each and every member who was a part of it and therefore some of them never knew how to use it some of them were not knowing some of them did it mischievously whatsoever i read i read 
I did not go in the depth of it, finding out whether it was right or wrong. But I read that one of the uh, topmost badminton player of our country, while he was communicating on the Zoom app, in his particular whole network, all those, all his particular other peers were there. Pornographic clips started coming across. But then I have a big question: Is that the pornographic things also can come so far as that if any one of the machine in that particular network is infected through some adverts. The I have some people walking to me and telling me that when I uh, when I'm there on my laptop or my desktop, suddenly a pop up blocks pop up comes in and shows me a pornographic clip. How to protect it? I said you only can protect it. Probably you may not be require a antivirus also to protect this. What you have to do is that you have to block the pop up which is available in your browser. And number two, the adverts or the pop ups which come. They come because that's your surfing habits. And those particular adverts, they come and reside on your desktop, on your laptop, on your mobile phone, because these particular adverts, the moment they reside on your laptop, whenever you visit any site, they immediately pop up because that were the habits which are being performed on that particular device. Therefore, it's very important. We talk about such a Bharat Abhyan. I also take, I also take that we should also have such internet abhyan. Which means very clear that the internet server, where so much information has been clogged and put across, we should be using it in a more, more secured manner. There should be proper practices in place. And if you follow that norms, I would say that you may not require an antivirus also to secure your particular digital device from any third party access. And all what we are talking about, this app is secured or this app is not secured. More it is on the usage what we do rather than telling that this app is not up to the mark, so on and so forth. In fact, in the case of a Zoom app itself, when I was doing uh, a forensic examination of that particular tool in terms of its usage, I found because of the administrative rights been given to all, because the screen sharing facility was given to all, some of them were naive users knowing not knowing how to share the screen. Some particular pornographic clip might have been percolated across. And then we said that this is secured or this is not secured. So then the, adver the adversary came that the super user or the administrator should have the con complete control of that app. And he should be in a position whom to add, whom not to add. And therefore, you can have a good cyber hygiene practice before we get hooked up to any video conferencing tool. Well, the recent trends in cybersecurity, well, I have some certain questions which have been popped up. I will answer those questions, but you keep on as and when you get the questions, you can keep on with. When I come across for the Q&A, I will try to answer as far as possible what the best I can do it. The recent trends in cybersecurity, one is the biometric hacking, uh, an increase in phishing attacks and sophisticated use of AI are among the top cybersecurity threats to be expected in 2019 as attackers stop at nothing to steal identities and evade detection through new techniques. But AI is the new buzzword. And when you talk about the AI, once again, all of these techniques of the AI, they are all available on internet on the open servers. And when they are open, when they are available on the open servers, there are no stringent security practices in place. And when these techniques are being used and embedded, maybe in an automobile or maybe in a household device, it's very important that what is the source from which this AI is being built upon. Most of these are coming from an open, open forum. And that's the reason that in the days to come, AI could be a little dangerous to go on with. Security breaches could be higher. If and, if and not, if we bring this in a closed domain, then I think the AI would be far more secure. But since now it is into the open domain, most of the things are knowledge sharing, which is going on with, it becomes that much risky to have this AI. And that's why biometric hacking in the days to come could be increasing with the use of AI. Attacks through theft of biometric data. Well, as more biometric systems for user identification and authentication are being implemented by various financial institu institutions in Meta, which is the Middle East, Turkey, and Africa, 2019 will see criminals exposing vulnerabilities in passports, touch ID sensors, and facial recognition. Well, I've got a point to say. And this, once again, is a good cyber hygiene practice. 
we buy a mobile phone which may be costing anywhere between 10000 rupees to a lakh of rupees and we download all possible apps which are available some of the apps they are used for stealing of information and while you put this apps in our mobile phone these apps remotely in a stealth mode in a hidden mode will start giving your information to a third party without your knowledge even though your mobile phone is protected with some facial recognition even though your mobile phone has got a passcode or any biometric techniques in place what's most important is that when you buy any particular device a costly device thinking that it is secure it becomes secure only by your particular using techniques and not because it is costly that's why it is secured so i think that that thinking has to be changed the mindset has to be changed so if you want to buy a costly device and if you are want to install all the possible apps in the world in your mobile phone please don't waste money your 10000 rupees mobile phone can do all the things what a 1 lakh 1 lakh worth mobile phone can do and that's why it's very important one of the app which comes to my mind and which was there which the government of india also issued some advisory on to it and that is the true caller many of us we indians have got true caller installed in a mobile phone we feel that any unwarranted persons number or any persons uh, any person calls us and if that person's name is not in a contact book or not in a phone directory his name his location his service provider his email id his facebook id all of this information comes on the screen on our mobile phone screen we feel that we are the sherlock holmes of the 21st century unknown persons information has come but let us also keep in mind that we are also unknown to somebody and when we call when we make a call to some person if our particular number is not stored in the mobile phone of that particular person our information is also given to that who i am from where i may be calling which service provider i use so on and so forth in fact 3 to 4 months before there was a big news you may also google it and find it out and said that ki true caller is now selling our data when we buy any when we install any app which is free of cost believe one thing that we have become the product for it 86% of us we indians when we install any app in our mobile phone we want free of cost and this free is always conditions apply therefore the best cyber hygiene practice would be that limit yourself as far as the apps what you install in your mobile phone go for most of the paid apps because if you go for the paid apps then the so called if there is any security breach or a privacy issue you can make that particular organization accountable well today it is not so we still don't have a data privacy policy place in our country which means very clear that investigating detecting such type of a crimes becomes a big challenging task in our system therefore i just wanted to make you aware that when you are having a biometric device a special device all security patches installed no use if you have got the apps installed in your mobile phone which are stealing the data and you cannot make them accountable simply because while you installed that app you never read the terms and condition you always said i accept i agree without going to the nuts and bolts of it what is that app doing what type of information it is giving to a third party without your knowledge so on and so forth well the ai and machine learning make attacks harder to detect ai and machine learning will play a more prominent role as the velocity and variety of attacks makes conventional approaches such as blacklist outdated and ill equipped to deal with the modern cyber threats in a simplistic manner phishing scams to soar well i'm sure that the previous resource person might have thrown some light on this phishing scams well there is also phishing there is also wishing is also there well more than the phishing now it's the wishing crimes which are taking place during this uh, pandemic era or this uh, corona virus just 7 8 days before probably i got one call from one of the senior citizens saying that i got a call from a person saying that ki my sbi card shall be blocked if i don't provide my information related to debit card to him so i said what you did he said i don't have an sbi card but that man was insisting no you have an sbi card when he said that i don't have a sbi card at that time 
the person at the other end side said if you don't have a sbi card but you will be having some other card at least all the norms are same for all the banks and the government of india has issued some guidelines that your card should be verified whether they are authentic or not and so i have some questions to ask you if you don't give me this particular answer for this questions i will presume that you are not the authentic user of the card a offense can be registered against you card could be misused so on and so forth now being a senior citizen hard earned money in the bank many of the times he may get confused he may get pressed by such type of a threats may share the information related to his card and at the net result is that he would be victimized losing his hard earned money so more of the phishing now the trends have moved towards the wishing point of you making calls we have also tried to verify that from where such type of calls are coming most of these calls it has been found it is coming from a district one of the district in our country which is very close to bihar that is jamthara in jharkhand and i am sure that now you also have some series on netflix well it is coming from there whatever may be the reason whatever may be the part but what i mean to say is that when these calls are coming the people people feel that they will not be caught but actually that is a wrong concept they are caught and they shall be caught in large numbers but i think rather than getting into that mode that they will be caught whatsoever it is always better that we should be assured that we should be conscious that such type of a calls when they come banks never give or make such type of a call asking you to divert your confidential information regarding your particular card to a third party without your knowledge so the phishing scams to so there are lot many fonts are there there are lot many uh, so called you know the characters which have the same illusion i and a small and a and a l they look same but then there is a difference between them so people criminals they make a site if if the site contains a character i embedded they may use that particular site same name but rather than i they will use l for a common person will not go in the depth of it to find out whether that site is containing that i embedded in that website name or it is l but at the end of the day it is a spoof site it is a site which is an unauthorized unauthentic one and that person may then become a victim of it to go ahead with that nowadays you find once again during this corona i have seen during this corona corona virus all possible types of crimes which are coming not only from terms of the defamatory part or not in terms of the rumors but also on the financial fraud crimes increasing exponentially because where the economy is under recession the crimes and the cyber crimes will that much go higher and cyber crimes why it will go higher because it's a virtual crime and since it's a virtual crime the jurisdiction issues are that much complicated a person sitting in us may make a person sitting in our country as a victim he may be using the server of a country which is in germany to that particular server he may be using a technology which is registered in netherland and he may be using a gateway which is registered somewhere in korea you have got five countries over here so under this point of view the jurisdiction plays a important role whom to be made accountable whether you have to make the person from korea to be accountable whether from germany one accountable whether from us to be accountable all these issues they come and therefore under these scenarios it's very important that we have got a good cyber hygiene practice in place we know that such type of a calls are calls which are made by fraudsters and we should be aware that we should not reply to such type of a calls and to such type of a links well now also we are getting it a link coming on whatsapp say the redmi mobile available for 4000 rupees which normally cost 10000 rupees please click on this link and when you click on this link it starts asking you all possible information about yourself what's your name what's your address what's your card number what's your cvv number what's your pin number what's your aadhar number all possible information confidential sensitive information has been asked and people give it i'm not saying all of them give it few of them give it thinking that they will get a redmi mobile phone for 4000 rupees which is costing in the market for 10000 rupees that mere 6000 rupees makes that person greedy but that for this 6000 rupees he may lose about 60000 rupees in the longer run of it
So whenever you get such type of an ad, such type of a links on your mobile phone, you have to be cautious that this is spoofed. This link is a is a is a link which will rather than giving me something will take away something from me. So the phishing techniques like the use of the homoglyphs, similar characters, for example, O zero and O number one and lowercase alphabet L, they look to be the same in terms of the visionary vision part is concerned, but in reality, they are different characters. They hold a different ASCII code sets. So the legitimate certifications, green lock and credential harvesting sites will increase. Flawless fishes will continue to prey on the gap in human firewalls, pivoting internally around organizations and intensifying efforts to better educate at staff. As uh, most of you are there from the academic field, I'm also a little inclined towards academic. I think it's very important that the students are being educated right from the eighth standard, not waiting them to the college or not waiting them to come at the postgraduate level, so on and so forth. Because I think age nine, 10, that's a time when, when children are being well acquainted with it. Well, nine, 10 is third, fourth standard. But then still, I would say from A and at least such type of a training should be given to the students where they have been learned. It may not happen that tomorrow they get to be victimized by such cyber criminals. The fake videos bring a new era of fake news. Lifelike computer generated graphics appearing to show video footage of events that never really happened will be used to mislead the public. Well, once again, during the coronavirus era pandemic, there was a video which was all made viral on the WhatsApp saying that those who are non-vegetarian should stop eating fish because the dead bodies now are being found on the, you know, the dead bodies have been taken from the hospitals and they are just thrown on the shore and the, the fish come and eats those flesh. So this was been, this has been percolated. God knows how many people might have stopped eating fish. But then when that video, was examined, forensically examined, it was found that it was not the video remotely connected with the present scenario. It was a video way back in 2014-15 of a Libyan boat which was crashed and the bodies were just placed on the shore of that particular sea. So today, rumor mongers, they take a video, they link it to some certain incidents and they just try to correlate and misguide the people. There was another video which was floating across about uh, Mr. Mittal, one of the big baron of the steel all over the globe, where Mr. Mittal, in one of the conference, he talks about some certain religion, some certain communities. And I'm also there in some of the WhatsApp group. So when I received this, I immediately called up the gentleman who sent this video to, to us in the group, asking him, have you confirmed? Is it Mr. Mittal? He said, no, I'm not confirmed, but it has come to me. And I'm very much, you know, for me, my religion is my particular whole thing. I don't want this thing to happen. So I floated it. See what Ms. Mittal has to say. Actually, that was never Mr. Mittal. It was somebody else who took, who made, disguised himself as he is Mr. Mittal. And Mr. Ms. Mittal's name was used to promote such type of uh, fake videos. I'm sure that even Ms. Mr. Mr. Mittal would come to know about this. He might have felt so bad that when he is doing so much good, for the nation, for the other countries, in terms of it's still one of the best, but his name has been misused, targeted in some other ways. So coming back, WhatsApp fake university, that's what I would like to say about it. Improved execution of existing attack types, well, better social engineering increases in credential stuffing attacks and more complicated malware with multiple stages and different form factors for transmission will make threats incredibly tricky to detect. With most of the so-called, you know, the servers which are used outside India and the malwares today, which are very difficult to detect because we have got a dark web, we have got the deep web, we have got proxies in place today. So investigation therefore becomes more tricky, more particular difficult to detect in the days to come about it. Mobile in the app malware. Well, Users of mobile devices are increasingly subject to malicious activity that pushes malware apps to their phones, tablets, or other devices running Android and iOS. So I have played, there are many apps which are malicious intention app, which are installed in the mobile phone, installed in the tablet, 
and one suggestion piece of suggestion to all my friends who are we here is that if you want to buy a mobile phone or for that matter any digital device please go to a shop buy it yourself as far as the online purchasing of any digital device well i have a little reservation because maybe it might have been some planted with some certain spyware with some certain apps which tomorrow can make your privacy at stake the other most important thing and that is when you are buying a mobile phone from the market when you are buying a mobile phone let's say an online purchase you are making it first check whether your mobile phone is rooted or unrooted because till the time you don't find whether your mobile phone is rooted or unrooted your mobile phone becomes that much unsensitive or unsecure in fact when you have a mobile which is rooted it means all the security patches all the security parameters in that mobile phone are compromised and therefore there are some certain apps which you can get on the google play store one of the app which comes to my mind at this moment is a root checker so you should install this app in your mobile phone and check whether your mobile phone is rooted or unrooted while this while this tool checks for your mobile phone it is rooted or unrooted it may take about say not more than 30 seconds if it happens that your mobile phone is rooted it means that your mobile phone is compromised of all the security patches of all the security parameters you don't have any other option but to get that mobile phone away most of these mobile phones which are rooted are available in the gray market and these mobile phones are available also as a second hand mobile phones which are very very cheap and when we buy that mobile phone not knowing that any mobile phone which is rooted all security practices in that mobile phone can be compromised the sms could be contents could be altered the whatsapp messages could be altered social networking sites chats could be altered and let me tell you each and every part of this information tomorrow if it has to go in the investigation or in the legal court can become admissible if the investigating officer has not examined that whether the piece of the information which is taken from this device is authentic or not with almost about uh, training more than 35000 cops in the country from the different different states in our country and training almost about now it's more than 4000 judges whom i've trained in the country i found that the awareness of this is very least so i don't want any one of us tomorrow to be victimized when we say that look we are victimized we ne never did it but till the time the law enforcement agency is made aware of this a common person may get victimized but today our people law enforcement people are getting to be trained our judicial officers are getting to be trained i'm sure that in the days to come the scenario of the cyber crime will be far far better in terms of the detection investigation and finally leading to conviction or acquittal depending upon the merit of the case iot attacks not slowing down well the three elements expected to play a very significant role in the increase of iot attacks according to the report are increasing network connectivity to edge computing the difficulty in securing device as more compute moves out to the edge and the last one the most important thing is that the exponential number of devices connecting to the cloud or updates and maintenance today you have got the cloud well um, when cloud started somewhere about 5 6 years before so one question was asked to me by one gentleman he said that ki how secure is this cloud i say in what context you would like to know he said that ki you say that the data is there in the cloud but if it will rain then don't you think that ki the data from the cloud will be erased and this was a question which was been said to me by a reasonably well qualified person i said it is not that cloud this is a different cloud oh he said is it so so what i what he meant to what what i am meant to think about is that people still are not aware what exactly the cloud the scenario the technology it works most of this cloud today are located outside india the server space is located outside india but then if you have the server place located within india the server within the cloud is in india the jurisdiction is india if you have got a technical parameters in place and most important 
all of this organizations which are giving the cloud service facility should abide by information technology act 2011 intermediary rules and regulations this law is in place from 2012 but sad to say that many of these service provider who are providing the services of cloud are not knowing that there is something called as an IT Act 2011 intermediary rules and regulations which has to be followed by the agency to ensure that the data what they store at their end of the customer is safe and secure. In fact, when I'm talking to you about the cloud and I'm talking to you about the cloud server, just a few days before, once again, during this coronavirus pandemic era, I had one WhatsApp message coming to me that people who are using Xiaomi mobile phones are susceptible to more cyber crimes because the data is not secured. The data will go to China and then the data could be misused, so on and so forth. There was a clear, clear guidelines which was given by Xiaomi which said that all the data of the Indians who are using the Xiaomi mobile phone are there on AWS and that server is located in India. But by the time they gave this particular guidelines, I don't know how many of them people started having a negative impression that the data is going to China and we should not use it. If that is the case, then I think we should stop using a mobile phone because 66% of the mobile phones which we Indians are using are manufactured in China. So if we have that particular tenacity and the guts that we should abandon the technology of China, stop using the China products, then I think we should start first of stopping the mobile phones because most of the mobile phones, what we carry in our hand are made in China. And we say that not to use TikTok. We say that we should not use the social networking app. We say we should not use Zoom. But the mobile, what we are carrying in our hand, that itself is manufactured in China. Stop using that. And I think then we'll be able to debate onto this particular part saying that, yes, this is what we should not be using about it. Well, I'm seeing the questions which are the which the participants are putting about it. I will come to it. I'll, I'm on the verge of finishing my presentation. Few slides, maybe five, six slides to go on with. The rise of SaaS, the software as a service. SaaS greatest advantage is also its greatest weakness. With SaaS, you need much less IT. This is a benefit at first glance, but upon inspection, it becomes a problem. You don't control the access of the data. Therefore, you don't know you are hacked nor do you have the tools to know about it so i you know the with the sas is the software what we are downloading onto our system and most of the softwares today have got their server jurisdiction location is china itself so i think now onwards before we start downloading any app or before we start downloading any software first see its origin find out whether it is it is manufactured by china and it is a server is in China. If it is so, don't do that. But if you do that, then I think you may have to go away with almost 90% of the apps which are available on the Google Play Store. And if you do that, then I could say that cyber hygiene practice in real terms has come to our country and many, many of the cyber crimes would then get to be eliminated. But we should have that guts then to stop using all the Chinese products, including the mobile phone, what we are using at this moment. Maybe some iOS. Maybe it's an Android, maybe it is an iPhone, maybe it is a Samsung, Oppo, all what name I said, most of these, or rather all of them, is all manufactured in China itself. The ransomware evolution. Well, ransomware is the bane of cybersecurity, IT, data professionals, and executives. It's actually, it's not a boon, it's become a bane now. It becomes a big pain for all of us. Perhaps nothing is worse than a spreading virus that latches onto customer and business information that only can be removed if you meet the cyber criminals' erroneous demands. And usually those demands land in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Then once again, during this time of this corona uh, pandemic, I had one very senior official lady uh, working in the revenue department in our country at the central level, They're calling me up at night, night 10.30 and said that, Ki, you know, there is an email what I have received from an XYZ person saying, that what I surf on my machine, with whom I chat, what I chat, along with the password of my email ID, the person claims that everything he knows about it. And he says in that email that if you don't pay me equivalent to 
nine hundred US dollars through Bitcoin, I will make all this particular data put in the public domain. Well, at night ten thirty, she called me up saying that ki oh I'm feeling unsecured. It's not that ki my particular computer has got some certain history or some some data from which I could be threatened with, but I'm concerned in one way, and that is. my particular laptop has got some confidential sensitive information about the revenue which has been paid by the people the tax which is paid by the people i want to be aware whether that information is gone to the hacker who is threatening me this is a ransomware and the person wanted that equivalent 900 dollars to be paid in bitcoin into a virtual account which later on cannot be traced across i examined that mail i that day itself because it came from a very very prominent official of our country same day same night at about 10:40 i had just gone to sleep i just woke up and i started working on to it half an hour of the investigation revealed that this particular email had come from nigeria it had floated from there and all the contents which were there in that particular email were actually fake there was no information which was available with that but a common person would have thought ki my information would be there in the custody of that person it's a threat person would have paid and this activity would have gone for a long long time till the person would have become bankrupt or might have become insane by adhering to the demands which is set by the other party so it's a ransomware so no more physical threat now these threats are happening through a logical way also by the misuse of technology iot threats well the iot is making sure that every single device you own is connected the problem is that all of that interconnectedness makes consumers highly susceptible to cyber attacks specifically insecure web interfaces and data transfers insufficient authentication methods and a lack of consumer security knowledge leave users open to attacks my big 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 question big suggestion to you is that please don't use any wifi in the public domain never use that and if you use any of the public wifi in the common domain the chances of you getting victimized increases to that extent one more thing i would like to share with you that of course now we are not able to go to the hotels well we don't know how many days that that uh, part will go on continuing with it but then it's my habit that when i go out of station many a times i am put up into an hotel i never use the wifi of the hotel never use it i have never used it and i shall never use it because that's one of the public place where your mobile phone could be compromised or you could be put under threat or you could be victimized to give you a small example the moment you go to the hotel the moment you get yourself registered by giving all your informations your credentials what is required as per the law you are allocated a room and when you are allocated the room most of them do ask ki is there a wifi now the wifi is there in all the star hotels you have a wifi it's not something which is a new rocket science i'm talking about it so what's the username and password so the username happens to be your surname most of the hotels say that the username happens to be your surname and what is the password your password is nothing but your room number followed by your surname and that's your password now this is the same particular uh, the same uh, same feature is used for everybody so if i am staying in 701 and if my my surname is decosta so the username is decosta what's the password 701 decosta that becomes my password and in 702 there is a gentleman who is sharma so his user his user id or his username would be his surname sharma what is this password 702 sharma that's his password now these informations to get is not something which is very difficult so a 701 person can use the wifi of a person allocated to 702 and if he commits some crimes by sending some spoofed mail or some threatening mail or does some any unwarranted activities from which particular user id it has gone oh it has gone from 701 but the 701 person has never used it it is used by 702 so are these particular techniques available with the hotel industry or with that hotel to know that no 
this particular wi-fi was used of 701 room number by the particular person who was staying in 702 if this is not known or this data is not stored at their end if the mac device of the mobile phone or the serial number of the device is not stored in their backend, which many of the hotels don't store it. So the person in 701 would be made accountable when he has not used that particular Wi-Fi remotely itself. What I mean to say is that things are getting to be connected. All things we are getting to be one connected. The world is getting to be small. My big suggestion to you, whenever this lockdown gets over, whenever we start staying in the hotels first for a business purpose when we go, or for our personal leisure trip whenever we go, stop using the Wi-Fi of the hotels because they are very susceptible for any crimes to take place and the investigation becomes very difficult to pinpoint who it is so, so on and so forth. And even if you see a Wi-Fi, a Wi-Fi also works in a specific 20 to 25 meter radius. So outside also, the account can be accessed. Credentials of a different person can be used and the internet could be misused of a different person. The attackers will target to consumer device in 2019 and beyond. Will we start to see consumers being targeted across a range of connected objects? This is likely scenario with examples coming out of child predators targeting IoT devices in toys designed for children. Well, children's will be children's are using all electronic devices, computerized based devices. And these particular toys also are now inbuilt with some certain uh, malwares, which can take their privacy information, so on and so forth. Attackers will become bolder, more commercial, less traceable. Attackers will look to base themselves in countries where cybercrime is barely regarded as a crime, and thereby placing themselves outside the victims' police jurisdictions. But some countries still don't have cyber law in place. So from this place, the cyber crimes could be originated. And then since there is no certain law in place, it can be a heaven for cyber criminals to commit a crime and to be let off. Attackers will get smarter. The attacker's capability to write customer specific targeted code will continue to improve faster than the defender's ability to counter or to get ahead of it. Breaches will get more complicated and harder to beat. Cyber criminals will look to grow their malicious activities using malicious code in ever more devious manner. Important part, cyber risk insurance. Well, that's the buzzword which will now be coming. Well, your data will now be insured. Already, there are some certain agencies, some banks, which already have come up with a cyber risk insurance. Well, today's uh, era, when we are all locked down during this coronavirus era, we will also have some agencies, some banks, with coming with, a, with us with a policy that is cyber risk insurance policy, where they will say that your data, it is susceptible. Your data will have some problems. Your data will be misused. Your data will be corrupt. Your data will be deleted. Your data will be unauthorized access where you can now have an insurance for it. Well, along with the life insurance now, we also have one more thing coming in, that is the data insurance and the data insurance now will be clubbed with the cyber risk insurance as the industry evolves we might see cyber insurance covering from loss of reputation and trust with their customers loss of future revenue from negative media or other exposure and improvement cost for security infrastructure or system upgrades the contactless card misuse well today we have that contactless cards we use well, the wi-fi enabled base cards and up to 2,000 rupees transactions can be done from that card without the OTP or without the PIN number. Well, today we go to a shopping mall. Well, I don't know. It's today. I mean, I'm talking today means I'm hopeful that in the nearest future, we all will be going to the shopping mall as what we were going before. And the same thing will come back. Whenever it comes, but I'm sure it will come back soon. But when you use that card, which is the Wi-Fi based card, the RFID enabled based card, up to 2,000 rupees can be Transactions can be done from that card without the OTP or without the PIN number. Therefore, under this context, if this particular cards, which are the RFID based enabled card, if you have got the Wi-Fi based logo on your card, if these cards get to be stolen or it get to be misplaced, the other person can use this particular card and up to 2000 rupees transactions could be done. 
the original authentic account holder to definitely will know by an sms but what's the use of an sms been coming after the crime been done very important if you are using a contactless cards please ensure that this card is preserved at your end don't give it to some unauthorized persons because if you give it to some unknown person up to 2000 rupees transactions could be done without otp without the pin and therefore it becomes dangerous actually this technique technology was done for our betterment such as we don't need to remember the pin number or the cvv number but then today criminals are using this to their advantage as a boon for them so in a day if they get 20 30 cards of this type of a nature 50 60 000 rupees they can make out of it without much knowledge to be applied there is also a misconception that we talk about cyber criminals most of them say that these cyber criminals are all the white collar people i have something to say to you that in my practical field of my investigations whatever i have done i found that 70% of them are blue collar they are not even 10 standard pass so for cyber criminals to be qualified is not something the education to qualify as a cyber criminal what is required is a zeal enthusiasm to know more about the darker side of the technology and how to misuse it without getting being caught and the top of it good social engineering skills how you can present your particular matter in front of a person in a very simplistic and socially recognized manner to a device used to copy details from rfid enable contactless debit cards if held as close as 8 cm away from a victim's card for the most of the mobile phones are having nfc enabled which can do all this it can copy up to 15 bank cards per second this data is then stored on devices internal storage system and thieves can connect the device to the pc using usb cables and transfer it using some special software when a special software special software is available on internet no big rocket science as a special software is concerned in fact when you talk about the internet you get possibly all the things on the internet till 130 i got connected to you till 130 there is no any rules and regulations as such that only this should be there or only this should be there or there is no agency which is yet appointed to check whether all the apps which are there or any of the play store is authentic or it is fake it's only after the usage is done only then it is realized oh this is authentic or not authentic and then a post mortem is been done but before the post mortem no checks have been made and therefore people get to be targeted and victimized so the check should be done before such type of a apps they are seen on any of the play stores which are available any desk app well this app uh, once again used by the financial the criminals they used to use and they used to tell the victims to install the app in their mobile phone giving them some certain stories that uh, your card will be blocked i will ensure that your card is not blocked giving them some certain hope that i am going to credit some money into your account and therefore this app should be installed but the any desk app which is also told by rbi is a hacking app the moment this app is installed on a victim's mobile it works like a hacking tool giving the complete control of the victim's mobile to that particular person remotely and then he in turn can commit a financial transaction on behalf of this authentic user debit the money credit into his account and get that particular money out what i mean to say once again is the any desk app which today now found after a lot of particular crimes been done then found oh this app was dangerous not to be used once again the post mortem revealed us but prevention there was nothing which is being done therefore i would suggest you that whenever you use some whenever you use such type of apps please first talk to the relevant government agencies talk to them if you are if, if any of this app is concerned you can directly communicate to rbi also talk to them chat with them you have got today most of the ministers minister of it law justice the twitter account is there communicate with them ask them does this app is there is it secure today the twitter world is so volatile that you will get a reply if not immediately but at least in 2 3 days you will get a reply whether it is vulnerable or whether it is not digital technology has got that biggest advantage of connecting people together and possibly giving the answers in the shortest possible of time but then yes important part is that 
how to identify that the information is right or wrong. That if you get the information from the official Twitter handle of that particular concerned person who is empowered to give you the suggestion, then you can conclude that this is authentic. Well, the last couple of slides. Well, those coming, I'm sure some of you may be coming from the legal side also. Some of the faculties may be there who are there from the law colleges also. And of course, this is not this couple of slides is not only for them, it's for everybody. Just saying that I am I know about cybersecurity, I know about cybersecurity. Well, no. Well, one of the biggest, biggest uh, cybersecurity professional, he himself became a victim one day. His website was hacked. And when he was, he used to uh, speak at the global level, saying that he, how to make the website secured. So one day his site himself got to be unsecured and some informations were being, you know, morphed, deleted, so on and so forth. But he never knew how to go ahead with a complaint, where to register, how to register with section. I think this part of the element also, we should be aware of it. So some of the sections which comes under the IT Act 2000, tampering the computer source code, well, section 65, of the Information Technology Act. Anybody who makes a uh, tampering to the original source code of a program, of an app, a software source is bound to be booked under Section 65 of the Information Technology Act 2000. Loss damage to a computer resource utility, well, to be booked under Section 66, which once again talks about the hacking. Obscene publication, transmission in electronic form, well, Section 67 of the IT Act. So all is Section 67A and Section 67B of the Information Technology Act 2000, along with Section 66E of the Information Technology Act 2000, that is privacy issue. The failure of compliance orders of certifying authority, well, Section IT Act, well, any agency fails to provide information to the law enforcement agency or to any organization to that matter who is empowered to get that information not getting it, then shall be booked under this section. Failure to assist in decrypting the information intercepted by the government agency, Section 69 of the Information Technology Act. Well, if at all, I'm a law enforcement agency. And if I ask my service provider, let's say my service provider is a mobile service provider. If I tell that service provider, of course, getting the due permissions from the various particular bodies, the various uh, bodies in place. And but if that agency doesn't compile or doesn't go ahead, with the instructions what I had put across over there, then he shall be bound to be booked under Section 69 of the Information Technology Act 2000. Unauthorized access, attempt to access to protected computer system. Well, I found uh, in the previous uh, session, I was just a listener. So I think the previous resource person had covered about this. Section 70 talks about protected systems. Protected systems are those, for example, the income tax website, the Aadhaar website, they are protected system website. Any person making an attempt to hack, forget about hacking, making an attempt itself commits an offense under Section 70 of the Information Technology Act. Up to 10 years of imprisonment could be made. Obtaining license or digital signature certificate by misrepresentation, well, Section 71 of the IT Act. Publishing false digital signature certificate, Section 73 of the Information Technology Act 2000, fraud digital signature certificates under Section 74 of the Information Technology Act 2000, and breach of confidentiality and privacy, very important, very important, very critical. And I would like to ponder on this in a just couple of minutes. And that is, when you get a call from a person who says that, hey, I'm calling from State Bank of India, I'm calling from Canada Bank, or I'm calling from XYZ Bank, and you are using this particular debit card. If that person tells my debit card, which is authentic, same, and if a fraud then this takes place with me, then somewhere I can conclude that my particular data, which is supposed to be there in the bank server, to be secured, because my data is very sensitive, confidential in nature. If that data goes in the public domain to a hacker, I have got all the right to ask a question to my banker that how come that imposter knew about my debit card details. Every service provider for that particular matter is bound by Section 72 of the Information Technology Act, where he shall not be in a position, or rather, he should not give any confidential data of any account holder to 
any unauthorized person. If he does so, then under Section 72, he shall be booked and up to three years of imprisonment could be there. There is also a section, Section 43A of the Information Technology Act. And then I heard in the last session, one of the participants also raised a question about the Arogya Setu Act. Well, both the sides of the coin story we have to know because we are a democratic country, we are a liberal country. So with both the sides of the part, we should know. The first thing is that do the people require to install the Arogya Setu app? Well, if the advantages are more and the disadvantages are less, you should go with the advantages side. So you should look if your health is important or your privacy is important. But if you feel your health is most important, then you should go for it. Point number two is that if you talk about this Arogya Setu app, well, there are some uh, technical pundits who have said that the whole Arogya Setu app is developed on a proprietary code and not developed on an open source. So if, it is, it, if at all it was, it was developed on an open source code, then there would have been some people, some technical specialists who would then do the audit of this code and check whether it is vulnerable or not. Since it is developed through a proprietary code, well, there is a bottleneck. And therefore, it should come into the so-called the open source. Well, it is in the proprietary source code. The government knows very well because such type of apps need not to be audited because anything which gets audited will have some sort of minor hiccups here and there. Well, at this time of saving the life, if you go ahead with this minor hiccups, I don't think that you'll be able to concentrate to save the lives of our people and our own life itself. Point number three. Well, when you talk about the privacy policy, as far as the app Arogya Setu is concerned, the important part is concerned, do we have the data protection bill in place? We don't have. So that's the point where critics say that if the data protection bill was there in place, then you would have come up with this app and then you could have collected this data because tomorrow if this data would have been misused, then you can make that agency accountable. So these are some of those issues which are going ahead with it. Last but not the least, if the data which is stored in this server, after 30 days, it is being deleted. But if you find any particular source of information where the data is not being deleted, then you've got the Ministry of IT where you can put this particular question and say that post beyond 30 days, my data is still there in the server. Why it is there? But only thing in one clause I would like to go, the data protection bill or the privacy bill, it has to come then people will be confident that, okay, such type of apps are governed by the privacy rules and we, and the, no iota of a doubt, not even one person with iota of doubt will be there in the minds of the people and people will start using this without any particular questions being asked across. I think that's the presentation what I had to put across to you. In fact, my time was from 1.30 to 3.30. Well, it's 3.25 in my watch. Probably um, this is very, very rare occasion when I have completed my session on dot time. But I still have got four or five minutes. And the four or five minutes, I just want to clear some few okay. And that is the first query what I want to clear is that about that authenticity of that email. Let me tell you, the authenticity of an email can be known by examining the headers of that respective mail. And let me tell you, every particular, every particular mail has got its own headers. So the examination of that headers will reveal whether the mail which is received is genuine or whether it is a spoof one. You can Google it on the internet and you can just find out extracting email headers of Gmail, for example. And when you write it, you'll get the steps. So you can forensically examine then through that headers whether that email is a genuine or whether it is a fake. But important part, every email has got unique headers. The headers will provide the information regarding whether the mail is a genuine or a spoofed. It will provide the information from where this email was being generated, from which server it came. It will provide the information from which country the location credentials will be coming. So these all valuable information is available in the headers, which will finally make it known genuine 
spoof location and then take it forward on the financial fraud last two couple of things before i will keep this whole forum open for you to ask me questions and that is the debit cards we have got two types of debit cards one type of a debit card is a debit card which is a international debit card well anything which is international debit card conclude that if this particular <coughs> card details of this debit card such as the debit card number the cvv number the expiry date and the and the and the name of the person on whose name the credit card or debit card is registered all these are available on this credit on this debit card if this information is used on a online shopping portal where this online shopping portal is then registered outside india and the server is outside india then there is no need of a pin number or a otp to commit the transaction but if you have a debit card which is registered which is used only in indian perimeter national perimeter and if you use this card on a shopping portal whose server is in india whose registration is in india then without an otp no transactions can be committed those who have got an international debit card quickly today what you may have to do is that you have to go to your bank site and within the banking site you will have an option that if you have a international debit card go and make us change go and make a settings change in that if this card even though it is a international debit card but i want this to be used only for my national purpose within the country and within the country when this particular card details are been used on that registered mobile number a otp will go which means that unless and until this pin number or the otp is not known the transactions cannot be made so thereby you can make your debit card and your credit card to be completely secure so you have to follow these norms and if you know these norms then i will say that doing digital payment doing any type of a digital transactions is relatively relatively safe and of course when you are there on social media sites like facebook like instagram please don't put your complete information on this sites and then don't please fight on that aadhar is asking my this information that information your 90% of the information is already available on facebook your name your age your address which college you studied which college you are teaching your friends and all you are putting with your own thoughts with your own imagination and most of these informations are very very personal and you are putting them with nobody forcing you to do it and tomorrow if there is any part of the information which is been percolated maybe some other some you get some information about a name of a person you make such a big hue and cry but let's first understand that on these social networking sites let us not put these are informations because these informations also become a fodder for criminals to commit an offense against us so finally i think make the cyberspace clean one well maintain cyber hygiene practice you follow and then i would say that internet is for our benefit so i'll keep this forum open if you have any questions please you can ask me the questions good afternoon sir afternoon. yeah i am dr kanak durga from hyderabad telangana sir uh, my question uh, you have given an elaborative and illustrative uh, presentation it was wonderful to attend this session i am very thankful for the organizers as well as you my i have only one question that is can you uh, give some insights for the researchers to work on it in what in what way in what way because it's a very no, because uh, we are talking you have been talking now you have mentioned that ai and ml uh, can help us in reducing these attacks so how can which one which one cyber attacks when we we in your presentation you have you told uh, especially biometric data huh. when you are talking about the biometric data where you said uh, a and ml will play a vital role in protecting this yeah so uh, can you uh, uh, give some uh, explanation on that i, I mean uh, elaboration on that how best on it can on, on the biometric you mean to say yes sir that is one of the points in your presentation sir 
because uh, hmm. actually the topic is very vast and uh, yeah, yeah, I just i would like to uh, i would like a couple of hello hello so Hello. Yes, sir. Ah, you're getting my voice. And now it is coming, sir. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. I think my mic was muted by the administrator. Anyway. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, what, uh, what I mean to say is that uh, when you're doing a biometric research, you can do on two facets because the the biometric what you talk about there are uh, essentially two categories. One of the category which comes on the biometric part. and that is the image based biometric and the second okay. one is biosensor based biometric i think uh, yes this two topics what you can take it for your research because there has been some elements of cyber crime which have taken place to this image based biometrics and uh, today also in most of the corporates in most of the organizations the biometrics which is used for the attendance time attendance they are image based biometric and when you say uh, image based biometric they are basically a graphic or a image file and because they are the graphic or the image file this image file can be saved maybe as a jpg or maybe as a tiff file and later on it could be used as a biometric of the authentic person the second part is that on the biosensor when we talk about the biosensor biometric it is a very secured way of a biometric because it has got lot of important components related to your biological facets of it it checks for the pressure of your blood flowing it does all other biological parameters in place before concluding that this biometric is of the authentic or this was of a fake person so i would suggest that ki as a research topic you should do more research on the biometric from the biosensor and the same biosensor then uh, biosensor biometric if we are putting in our systems like aadhar i'm sure it is there but if we can make it more more secure biosensor biometric can be used tomorrow in cryptocurrencies it can be used for uh, data mining techniques so on and so forth so the research topic i think you should be taking more the biometric from the biosensor and image based well it is slowly fading out and i think uh, days to come with the embedded with the ai artificial intelligence only one biometric will speak and that is the biosensor biometrics yes uh, i think uh, uh, professor uh, dipanjay shrivastava from uh, jamshedpur is here he is yes. willing to ask some question from you yes. dr dipanjay are you listening us yes yes sir Ha, ha, please, please have your question, madam. Hi, sir. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Please, please ask. Hello. Hello. Professor, you are here. Uh, please ask the question. Hello. Yes, yes, I am listening. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening. This is Anand Prakash Dubey evening. from uh, Varanasi. In yeah, fact, yeah. Uh, you started your deliberation with <laughs> my by taking me as an example that I was asking twenty thousand rupees <laughs> because I was stuck in Allahabad. <laughs> So I am okay. still waiting for the money to be transmitted, uh, transferred in really? my account, but still <laughs> I didn't Very receive. <laughs> I was awaiting this question to come, you know, from you, and uh, and I purposefully did not answer this question because I know that you will ask the question. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir, for taking me as an example and explaining a yeah. uh, lot of things in uh, in a way so that we can feel it that it is related to our daily uh, life. and uh, yes. really it is not possible that we uh, look back side of 20 years uh, before that our how was our uh, life that period of time and how our life has become now 
so yes. everywhere desertization is there even we are drinking we are eating in that way in that form we cannot uh, leave it because it has become the part of our life right so what is your opinion sir i mean how can we make our life better because we are stuck uh, i heard uh, i have um, some of my friends they message me and you also might have uh, seen this kind of messages that human beings are stuck and machines are learning <laughs> so we are stuck a lot of things are in our mind so how can we live better our life okay. what is okay. your opinion because that may be a, not a technical question uh. <clears throat> I think that is a question related to uh, every human. <laughs> okay. I think so what is your opinion, to... sir? Yes, yes, yes. I think my first responsibility is that uh, how I can make you safe. Because I I received a, a WhatsApp message from your number to me. You know, please transfer twenty thousand. I am stuck up in Allahabad, so on and so forth. I think the big question is that uh, how this was possible. Well, I want to throw some light onto this. Well, uh, all this was possible. uh through voip voice over internet protocol tens and thousands of voip are freely available on the internet so set up a server and from that server you route all the messages they look authentic as if they have come from a whatsapp account so that's the technique the voip which was there now the second part is that which i think is i'm equally responsible for it to all of you is that how to identify whether the tomorrow uh your student may come or tomorrow a person may come and say that look this person chatted like this with me and you may then try to develop a uh, you know you may try to develop and say oh is this person like this but actually the person is not like that so how then to identify this it well is very simple you know um if you are having your android mobile phones you may just take it in your hands and i will quickly tell you how to identify between a a, a fake whatsapp message and a genuine whatsapp message believe me it won't take more than 1 minute and uh, first i will tell to those who are having the android based mobile phone because 87% people in our country they use android based mobile phone uh, about 11.5% use ios and the remaining 1.5 they still use the symbian or for that matter the windows operating system so on and so forth i'm just talking about those who are using smartphone all the more than 50% still are using the feature phone not for them but for those who are using a smartphone If you had an Android iOS, uh, Android sorry, Android operating system, you can just take your mobile phone, go to any of the WhatsApp chat. You can go to any of the WhatsApp chat. Maybe you can go into a group chat, or maybe you can go into the uh, individual chat or a personal chat with whom you had with a your friend or whatsoever. And then you want to identify a piece of a text, whether this piece of a text actually originated from this person or whether it was spoofed. So take any text. and just uh, select that text by pressing it at that text the moment you select it you'll find that on the upper portion of your mobile phone you'll find on the upper portion of your mobile phone you will find there are some certain images coming the left arrow the right arrow the delete bucket the star you know copy paste if you get all these images or icons on your mobile phone the moment you select that message or you select that text conclude that this is a genuine whatsapp chat in my case when i had this uh, whatsapp chat from the friend who just uh, called me up now the moment i select his message what will come on my device is that not those images the left arrow left key the, le the, the left right copy paste delete all those won't come for me what will come on the top of my screen is a two words edit message and the two wordings called as edit message will conclude that this is a spoofed message and never was originated from this number well it's that so simple so tomorrow if at all you have been targeted and said oh you generated this message please follow this and tomorrow god forbid if a law enforcement agency says that we got a complaint against you that you sent such message to xyz person tell him that this is the way that how you can identify between a spoof whatsapp message and a genuine one for those who are using ios and iphones if you take your mobile phone in your hand very simple just go to any of the group chat or any of the individual chat select a text chat and the moment you select a text chat on the top portion of your mobile phone you won't get your left arrow right arrow copy paste delete you won't get anything rather you'll get a drop down menu and in the drop down menu you'll get something called as reply forward 
you'll get those drop down menu on your screen if you get a drop down menu on your screen for the selected text conclude that this is a genuine whatsapp chat and not a fake one and if it is a fake one even for an ios even for an iphone on the top portion of the screen two words will come called as edit message which concludes that this is a fake one fictitious a false one so that was the first responsibility through you to all the participant how you can identify and now for the main question what you asked me well uh, we are just like in the zoo now the animals are birds outside and we are inside now occasionally they also come at our place and they are asking us how are you all because we can't go out and they are outside now but during this time see using digital technology using digital technology we have to do at any cost and without that it's very difficult to live on with so i would not discourage the fact that we should not use digital technology we should use but some practice the practices we may have to follow and those practices what we may have to follow is that the first thing is that don't download apps from some illegitimate source very important. number 2 if you are downloading any app which is made by the government of india go to the government of india's website and download from there don't download from any of the play store for that matter number 3 if you are using any type of a digital technology for money payments or if you are making any payments online understand what exactly the app is understand each and everything in it for example if you are using google pay there is something called as pay there is something called as request now what is pay what is request i believe that you should be learning about these headings about this wording more rather than talking about the architecture of it that whether this technology is built on a robust platform or not fourth and critical point is that use digital technology where you feel that you have to use it don't use it because your friends are using it because uh, many of them may be ignorant five when you are having any whatsapp message where you find that key there is something a message which is against a religion against a community please do a fact check there are some websites which are available on the internet like boom life like alt news alt news is alternate news you go on this website paste that particular message and to a large extent it shall tell you that whether this message what you have received is fake or not and last but not the least during this particular era when you are a part of any group please make some rules and regulations of the group what message should come and what message should not be there because if uh, unlawful messages are percolated in the group chances are there the admin of the group may be held responsible for it and if the admin of the group is responsible all the members could also be liable for that particular mistake so digital technology is for our betterment well there is a saying train accident there you are plane accident where you are that doesn't mean that if we don't travel by plane we travel by plane but so far as you know about the security parameters in place they no harm because traveling by plane is considered to be the most secure as traveling by train itself so that's what the suggestion i would like to give it out thank you thank you sir thank you very much. Yeah. yes uh meanwhile i would like to make request from all the participants that uh, the feedback form is available in your chat board so please fill up the form it will be uh, an added advantage for us as well and uh, you all uh, if you feel uh, if you feel like whatsoever you have uh, witnessed over here you can write over there it will be highly uh, uh, like suggestive from uh, from our point of view and rest i would like to uh, call uh, dr dipanjal shrivastava from uh, jamshedpur and he is willing to ask his question sir please if i am audible please ask hello hello ah, please 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 thank you sir thank you very much for your interesting and informative session thank my sir shrivastava jamshedpur cooperative college jamshedpur jharkhand from yes. department of uh, 
I want to ask the questions are very common and normal questions. How can any cyber hacker withdraw amount using our PAN card and a mobile number connected to any particular bank uh, by hiding it from us? How is this possible, sir? And what? Um, how can we prevent and escape from these types of situations, sir? I think uh, uh, what we are saying that uh, PAN card being linked to your bank account and then the money is being stolen or withdrawn from the account. Well, this was the modus operandi which was being followed by the cyber criminals a couple of years before. Now it is not so. The reason is that because the banking system has become very robust now. It has got multiple layer authentication. The layer of authentication is OTP. The layer of authentication is the CVV. So in today's context, only having the PAN number linked to your bank account and a fraudulent transactions is made. No, it cannot be done. A couple of years before, I do agree what you are saying is right. But in today's scenario, where the CVV number or the OTP number any one thing is required to do that. If that also is being compromised or if that also has been told, then you can't make the bank liable. Then it becomes a responsibility of the user who has diverted his particular important credentials to that cyber criminal or to that hacker. But there is one good news also. And that is tomorrow, if uh, any person gets victimized, assuming I get victim, I get victimized. And if I get victimized, fraudulently a transaction is done from my account rbi has issued some guidelines and the guidelines is that within three working days or three working days if i go to the bank if i go to the bank i have a my say for example i have my account in state bank of india so i go to my branch and i fill up a form and in that complaint form i fill up that key in what way i feel that i have been victimized and the bank has got their internal team where they'll verify my complaint. And if they find that is a truth in my complaint, within 30 days, they will repay the amount back into my account. But if the bank doesn't reply to you within that 30 days, then you can approach the one more layer of the bank that is called as the banking ombudsman. You can approach the banking ombudsman, put your query to them and tell them that I have become a victim of the cyber crime, the bank has not responded to me, the banking ombudsman will fight the case on your behalf without taking any money from you and shall find out what is the right cause of that matter. And if they find that there's a negligence on behalf of the bank by which your money has been fraudulently transferred, your money will be created back into your account. I hope I'm clear with that. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, simply, I have one word, sir, for you. It's wow. <laughs> Just because really? uh, with the classic and realistic example, you have really created a wow effect amongst our participants. Yes, it's officially, it's very difficult for an individual to get rid of most of the applications just because of Android phones. It is coming. Uh, uh, it is actually coming free of cost like sort of thing when you are spending around 50,000 for an iPhone and you are spending 5,000 for an Android phone. Obviously, it is coming free of cost, just 10% of cost of from uh, in comparison with the iPhone. And obviously, the Google ownership is also required just because they are uh, the data greedy one. Uh, this is my perception that yes, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they all are doing their analytic work just because of the data perceived by us, perceived by the users. And this is why the digital footprints become a, a destiny nowadays for us, for the users like us. And because of all such devices coming cheap, we are uh, facing lots of problems. And thanks a lot for your wonderful deliberation, sir. It, it's a proud privilege for us at Gopal Narayan Singh University, Faculty of Information Technology, Faculty of uh, Management Sciences, Faculty of Management Studies. We all are here welcoming you 
and uh, uh, greeting you with uh, words of uh, like thanks and all just because you have spared your time valuable time with us and you have did you did a wonderful job while uh, explaining those nutshells uh, regarding this uh, cyber security and all aspect and uh, this i think uh, the take home for all our participants is very much uh, in comparison to uh, any other fdps that has been organized in recent days and uh, in the post uh, in the pandemic era, uh, era of covid 19 so um, we uh, i would like to request our uh, dean alok sir who is here also for his words and uh, i think our secretary sir is also here so um, alok sir please uh, please have some words and then pre please introduce our secretary sir also just because uh, we would like to finish sure, sure. Uh, 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 sure abhishek ji thank you Sure, Abhishek ji. Thank you very much, and we had a very uh, informative session, a very wonderful session, and of course, uh, uh, the crux of the entire one-day uh, event was that. उसको हिंदी में अगर कहा जाए कि आज के युग में डाटा ही आटा है, तो entire food of uh, thought for the entire corporate world, for the legal entities, for we academicians, for the scholars, for the students, everything is data, 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 and data. But Uh, the query is what to do with this kind of a data and how to secure our own data so it was a fabulous and a wonderful experience with the, all the three speakers and especially i uh, though i am not uh, from uh, the technological background but i enjoyed right from morning i was just glued to my laptop and uh, i could find out yes these are some small things which uh, if we incorporate even if we are not a technical person but we can surely make ourselves more secure the liability and the onus is mostly on us the legal agencies are there to help us out no doubt and uh, thank you sir for uh, enlightening us on this uh, wonderful topic and in a very lucid manner because i saw i was just glued through the screen and i am seeing that uh, in the post uh, lunch session the number of participants has uh, gone up a bit normally it is just reverse of the trend when the program comes to an end the people move out and here the people are moving in it is a clear cut indicator how successful has been our program so now i invite our uh, drivered secretary sir uh, shri uh, govind narayan singh ji who is the real architect behind the entire online shows which uh, we have been able to put up in the past one month and he took just around a week or so to get the systems implemented and we are very fortunate to have him here uh, sir uh, we, we would like to hear something from you uh, regarding this fdp uh, thank you thank you dr alok it is all combined effort uh, let me first tell me what a day we had i mean it was so great so great i never imagine it will pan out that way you know and uh, and at the end of the session no i said uh, i am very frankly telling you i am slightly scared how one 